including our nice people who donated their time to teach the hands-on labs, John Sudaris, who runs the San Diego user group, who came up here today just for you guys and has been an organizer. Yay! Thank you, John. He's put a lot of time and effort into this over the last couple of months. Intel has been amazing, of course, particularly Sujata, Michelle, uh, sorry, I'm saying that the French way, Michelle, um, Lindsay, the team from Intel has been incredible. Uh, so thank you all for volunteering your time. Thank you. Today and for the last two months. Um, and okay, tell me when you're ready, you ready? All right, so, okay, so now I'm gonna ask everybody back there to keep your voices down because now we're at the important part and I don't want Sujata to have to yell. So, um, <laughs> so I'm gonna hand it over to Sujata and when you're ready to go, we will start the timer. Hi everyone, I'm Sujata Tibrewala, uh, Community Development Manager for Networking at Intel. If you are curious about what my role is, uh, come back to me, I'll, I'll clarify. Because it's a, I do realize it's a non-standard role. So, yeah, a quiz later on this. <laughs> so who here cares about networking? Oh, I see quite a few hands, okay. Yeah, you're conscientious enough because you're streaming, right? Now we're streaming, so networking is doing all of that. So who's familiar with this diagram, you know, the network function virtualization? So on the left, you have the fixed function boxes, and, and, and on the right, you have uh, the same network functions virtualized, and of course, they are orchestrated with OpenStack, that's why we are here celebrating OpenStack birthday party. Now, why do we like virtualization? They give you scalability and agility. But if that's the case, why are we not moving to them? Why don't we like them? We have concerns about latency and performance, okay? So rest of my one, uh, three and a half minutes, I'll just talk about what we do in Intel to solve this problem. So uh, anybody heard about user space networking? Okay, there are a few people who have heard of it. So why is it important? So when the packet comes to your network interface card, that's the bottom green block here, it goes to your kernel space, and then it has to go to your networking application, which means it, there is a packet copy, there is a kernel interrupt which happens, so it slows down your networking application. So what do we do about that? How about we take the packet directly from the network interface card, directly to the user space? No packet copy, no interrupts, no contact switches. Anybody heard of DPDK? Okay, Data Plane Development Kit. That's what it does, simple. So no interrupts, removes data copy, and then because the network, network stack is in the user space, it can be streamlined and optimized. In kernel space to do any change, it's a nightmare. Another optimization. Anybody familiar with L1, L2, L3 caches? Sure everyone is, right? So when you do a packet lookup, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I wanted to use it as a pointer. So when you do a lookup and you have a miss, so instead of four nanoseconds, you go to L3 cache and you have a 40 cycles lookup, which is not good. So what do you do? You do bulk packet processing. If you attended MJ session, he talked about that, right? So that's one of the ways how DPDK uses a hardware construct to optimize the software packet processing. Now Intel uh, launched Skylake processors recently, how many have heard of that? Okay, good. So one of the things, uh, or one of the architectural advances there is for multi-core processing. So when a packet wants to come from one core to the other in the Broadwell or the architectures before the Skylake, they had to go from, uh, pass from one core to the other so that would uh, add to the latency. So follow the green line, that's the path the packet takes from the core zero to core n. Whereas in the Skylake architecture, you have a mesh. So you have a direct path 
for the packet. So that's the architectural advance that has been done now. So since I had very little time, I just gave a few examples of like, you know, how we are doing packet processing optimization. So uh, uh, how many have heard of FIDO? Okay, so FIDO is a software switch which was open sourced by Cisco last year. Yeah, we have Sylvia here. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they optimized the software switch on the Skylake architecture, and guess what? They have broken the terabit barrier. Anybody knows about software switches and performance? They know what that means. Okay, so with that, I'm done. Hi, I'm Sylvia Spiva. I'm with Cisco DevNet, and this I don't have slides. I have a website for you, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Cisco DevNet is. First of all, a shout out to my fellow Cisco teammates. Anyone from Cisco here? Raise your hand. All right, welcome. Anyone specifically from Cisco Cloud? No? Oh, very nice. Okay, great. So uh, before I joined Cisco DevNet, I was a social media manager for Cisco Cloud, and that's where I met many of you um, uh, folks from OpenStack, and I know that's a fun bunch, and uh, I really appreciate you having us here today. But I'm with DevNet now, and many of you have uh, the brand new DevNet shirts. Who was lucky enough to get a shirt today in their size? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. So. If I could get you to go to developer.cisco.com and check out what we have there. What is developer.cisco.com? It's the home website for DevNet. And if you've been to Cisco Live or if you've been following um, you know, what our new leadership has been talking about, it's really about you know, taking Cisco from just a hardware company to, into software, and we need to have programmability into everything that we do. So when you go to our website, when you go to DevNet, um, we should have the APIs and the training material and the conversations we'd love you to be a part of for, um, you know, for cloud, collaboration, um, enterprise networking, security. It should all be there. And if it's not, if there's anything else that you'd like to see, please let us know because we are, we're still a pretty new team and we're growing um, that community. So um, for, for those of you who got your shirts, uh, you know, uh, that's awesome. If you'd like a shirt, go ahead and register. Um, you can look up cs.co slash 7b day and uh, register, let everyone know you are here today. And please um, also follow us on Twitter at Cisco DevNet. Again, we're very new and we want to grow this community. We want you to be part of it. Thank you so much. Anyway. Okay. The talk today is about like, why should you run Kubernetes on OpenStack? This is some technical insights from the VMware Integrated OpenStack team. Uh, needless to say, I work in the VMware Integrated OpenStack team at uh, VMware, of course. Uh, let's cut to the chase. So why would you choose OpenStack to run Kubernetes? Why wouldn't you, honestly? Uh, it's been seven years, and we have a wonderful community that we have built here. Kudos to all. Congrats. And uh, clap your hands. I can waste five seconds on that. Anyway, in OpenStack, seriously, in OpenStack, you have everything that you need to build, uh, you have everything that you need to build your production grade Kubernetes cluster. Uh, let's see why. Okay, that's not working. Okay, okay. Is it serverless? No, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, why should you choose OpenStack to run Kubernetes? Let's see why. Uh, reason number one easier deployment. Actually, it says reason number four on the slide, but why should George Lucas have all the fun, right? <laughs> uh, so, easier deployment. There are tons of tools available out there to deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack. You could just do a Google search and be sure to search for Kubernetes on OpenStack, because if you do the other way around, there are so many other tools too. Uh, so, there are tons of tools to deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack. You could use some of the native tools uh, to deploy, or you could easily build a custom installer. You could hack it up. It's pretty easy to do that. And reason number two, the control plane flexibility. If you are building a production grade Kubernetes cluster, then the, there are a lot of chances that you need it to be highly available and highly scalable, right? And with OpenStack, you could leverage a lot of OpenStack services to build this uh, architecture to pull this off. It's very easy to do that with the with, by using OpenStack. 
And reason number three, and this is this this is what will take most of the time, is that uh, the cloud provider interface that's available in Kubernetes for OpenStack. So why do you need a cloud provider interface? The idea is that uh, you jo you don't just consume the underlying cloud for its capacity, but you uh, consume the underlying cloud some of its services to run your container workloads in Kubernetes. So this is really important. Often, like when you deploy. When you're looking at the options to deploy Kubernetes on a specific cloud, this is what should be the number one in your mind. And fortunately for OpenStack, we have a cloud provider, and that just works. Honestly, it's a true story. It really works. Uh, the first time I deployed, I was not very hopeful, but it turned out that all the services uh, that is provided by the cloud provider interface actually works. So what's the deal with the cloud providers? Actually, I wanted to say this on uh, with my Seinfeld imitation, but I'm too nervous today to actually do that. <laughs> I'll probably in the next meetup it'll save some embarrassment. Um, so, one of the first reasons is like external load balances. So, if you have services in your deployment, like front-end services or some API gateways, they may request a load balancer from the underlying cloud, and uh, Kubernetes cloud provider for OpenStack will take care of actually creating that load balancer by talking to Neutron. Uh, you know how complex it's to create a load balancer in OpenStack, right? You need to create a load balancer, you need to create a listener, you need to create a pool. So all this is taken care of by the OpenStack cloud provider and Kubernetes, and it'll, uh, it'll give you a service IP, uh, it'll actually give you an externally routable IP to your pod. So this is all taken care of by the cloud provider. So that's really awesome. Uh, you should really learn about it. It, it. it is something that works out of box. Uh, when you deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack. The next is persistent volumes. So I'm sure that if you are deploying any cloud native applications, you will have stateful services, right? And they need stateful services, need persistent storage. And uh, with the OpenStack cloud provider for Kubernetes, you, uh, the, the OpenStack cloud provider for Kubernetes will take care of actually leveraging the Cinder volume service to create the Cinder volume and attach it on the node on which your pod is actually running. So this is super awesome. And uh, I, I, in the chances, in the, in the cloudy world, it, there's always a chance that your pod might go down, your node gets killed. Uh, in this case, Kubernetes will automatically bring back this pod on a new node, right? Just like they brought back Jon Snow and Game of Thrones. Any GOD fans? No? Come on, no GOD fans. Anyway. Uh, so, and in this case, the OpenStack cloud provider will make sure that this Cinder volume is detached and attached to the right node on which your pod is running. This is all might seem like something uh, uh, really uh, impressive. It it's actually is. You should try this out. And a uh, few other awesome things. I think I have exactly one minute left. Uh, so you could leverage Keystone for your Kubernetes services, uh, for authenticating to your Kubernetes API. You could even write a custom authorization plugin based on Keystone. There, there are tons of things that you could do uh, with this possibility. And few things to watch out for. Uh, as you scale, right, you will be adding new Kubernetes nodes to your uh, uh, control plane. And uh, one thing to remember is that all your Kubernetes worker nodes will now make API calls to OpenStack, and you need to be aware of that. So hopefully your OpenStack cloud is like highly available and runs on really bulletproof infrastructure. And uh, lastly, Kubernetes plus OpenStack, it's a powerful combination to run your container workloads. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so uh, my name is Billy Field with Trilio Data. And um, what we do is we provide OpenStack data protection, uh, backup and recovery. Um, and what I'm gonna show you today is uh, from the tenant space, what we provide uh, from a resiliency perspective, okay? So the good thing about Trilio is uh, from the tenant point of view, we've integrated seamlessly into Horizon. We also wrap up a full uh, REST API and CLI. But from a tenant space, uh, looking at the uh, protection and recovery schemes, uh, from a Horizon perspective, you jump into the projects, we expose a um, brand new tab called backups. And as, a and, and as a tenant, I can go ahead and identify my workloads, right? So my application workloads. In this, in this scenario, I have a uh, gold, silver, and bronze, and I've defined my recovery point objectives as a four hour, 12 hour, and uh, 24 hour RPO. And what we do at Trilio is we get the whole entire application blueprint of the cloud. Uh, everything from the networking stack all the way down to the Cinder volumes uh, uh, configurations in, in uh, data stat. So 
Um, at, at, again, at the tenant space, what I can do is if I go and look at a service level agreement that I've uh, defined, Silver, uh, what you'll see here is I have a three VM workload that uh, is comprised of my application set. And what I do is here's my points in time of that, uh, the, like I said, the cloud footprint of that, uh, of that protection scheme, okay? So each one of these points in time is a fully formed image that sits in QCAL2 format. And what that means for us at Trilio is we can instantly access it for any purpose at all, from a recovery standpoint, from a file and folder level recovery standpoint, okay? And when I dive into what this points in time look like, looking at the metadata point of view, we capture again everything from the network perspective, so the, the virtual NICs, the IP addresses. We go across the top there with security group capture. We go grab the VM flavors from Nova, the volume types, the networking, everything uh, nuts to soup there with, uh, within the cloud. And again, from the tenant space, now what we, we, we allow the self-service capabilities within, within, uh, within the cloud. So if I spin up my ser virtual servers, I now have a methodology of protecting and recovering on demand as a tenant, okay? So once you define the workloads and you get everything under management, um, diving back into the workloads, I can then offer up the reverse of the backup, which is the recovery. And if I come back in and dive into the snapshots, we offer a couple different interactions. Number one is I can do a full-fledged in-place recovery, so I can take that cloud at that point in time, blueprint all the way down to storage, restore that back into production as if I didn't lose it at all. I also offer a, um, a one-click restore, which allows you to take volume configurations and volume types and overwrite just, ver uh, just the volume structures back into production, preserving the VM UUID and all the context of the VM. I can do a selective restore, which maybe my rest restoration process has to do with not back in place, but maybe I want to put it into a different region or a different availability zone altogether with different parameters, different network, different volume types, different compute perspectives. So selective restore allows you to do that. And everything I talked about today is VM level, VM level, VM level, but we offer an instant mount option that allows you to take the virtual machines, mount just the volume structures to a, a file manager that we offer, and basically extracts all the volume types so I can peruse uh, through a web-based front or uh, SSHFS. I can use SCP to get volume structures, files, folders, and then copy that back into, uh, into the source location or, or dedicated target location I, I wanna uh, provide. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's nothing really super bedazzling about backup and recovery, so um, we're the only one in the space that does it. And again, we're OpenStack tenant level backup and recovery, and I've got a minute left, so we're good on time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about getting storage right, uh, specifically for clouds. Um, we are at a birthday party for OpenStack. There we go. <laughs> So uh, last year we hosted the sixth birthday party, had a great time. Uh, when you're done listening to all this talk, we can uh, bust out the cupcakes and uh, start partying down. So um, just to move through it pretty quickly, storage is a critical part of any cloud deployment. Uh, in my career, I've talked to hundreds of folks who've deployed uh, OpenStack environments, and people who should have not failed have actually failed. And being kind of a, a storage nerd, I think a lot of the reasons why they've had trouble is because their storage system couldn't do what they needed to do. Uh, it couldn't deliver the performance. It couldn't meet the needs of the uh, users, the cost issues. Um, you know, the users are really actually very, very important. Uh, sometimes it's data loss, and ultimately, if you don't get this part right, you end up with a, a project failure, which nobody wants to see. And I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate when that happens for everybody. So key factors to consider when you're looking at storage, it's especially for uh, cloud environments, is around performance, and performance is not just about how fast it can go. There's a lot of buzz in the storage industry about flash storage and can you get like 10 million IOPS in a single U appliance. Uh, that's actually nice to have, but you really want to think about latency as well. So when you're testing and evaluating storage, make sure you evaluate what latencies it can deliver. And, and more important than that, does it have uh, additional capabilities? Can it meet all of the needs of your cloud? Because if you just get fast storage, it might be too expensive, you might need slow storage, multiple vendors, lots of trouble. Next is scale. How big is it going to get? A lot of OpenStack clouds, I think the last survey, I forget the exact numbers, but the majority of clouds are fairly small. It's relatively easy to solve those problems. If you do plan to get bigger, those are bigger problems to solve. And you really need to think about what happens when I get to my hundredth rack. What am I going to do? What kind of solution do I have for that? 
The agility piece is also important because as you noodle through the technology, the people that operate this stuff at scale will tell you, depending on your solution, you might not be able to add a little bit of storage because there's pain. Maybe you need to add a whole bunch at the same time. Uh, Swift has this when it's rebuilding its rings. You have to be very mindful about what does it mean, how agile, can I bring in another class of service and so forth. Uh, the operations piece, you know, we talk about day one, talk about day two in the, in the industry. Operations, of course, is super, super critical. If you can't make it work, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how fast it goes. You could have a great, I, one of my cars is a Triumph. I don't know if people know about British cars. Fun car, I don't drive it because I'm afraid I'm gonna get somewhere and have to walk home. It doesn't matter how fast it goes. You need to make it sure it works. And then, of course, cost, 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 cost. Can you take advantage of the trends on media, take advantage of the trends on, on hardware? Uh, Intel is talking about their, their Skylake, the, the Pearly systems, they're unbelievably fast. You wanna get that stuff into your critical environments as quickly as possible. How do you do that? How long is it gonna take? Um, so what if there is a, a system, this is vendor time, right? So what if there's a system that could deliver the performance and you could get sub 100 microsecond latencies on the workloads that need it, but you could also have large capacity nodes that are optimized for cost. On the scale side, it can grow to petabytes between mixed systems, mixed vendors, which is another major problem at scale is you, you used to buy Dell and your boss comes in and says, we're not buying Dell, we're buying HP now. How do you address that within the solution? And then that agility piece, to be able to automatically uh, onboard new classes of service. How do you move data between the, uh, the systems, the timer turned off, uh, between the systems so that you know that this workload is always going to be in the right spot? Is, that a, is it a migration? Is that a user problem? Uh, Amazon just now got that feature working. And then the operational piece. Is it simple to use? Is there someone going to stand behind you? How much does it cost to get it fixed? Are you relying on having a team of people who know how it works? Because when that team of people go get a better job somewhere else and you're left with this big box, what do you do with it? Uh, and then last, of course, is the cost. As we see major trends in the storage industry, we're seeing this shift away from bespoke systems developed and designed with custom bezels and lights and all this flashiness to commodity-based servers because they can do that work now. So enter the Deterra solution. It's built from the ground up. It's designed for cloud deployments. We're built on a scale out architecture, for example. Uh, we continually optimize the, the infrastructure based on the, the needs of the workloads. We can uh, transparently handle different types of media. So the flash memory summit that's coming up in a couple weeks, we're in two keynotes from two major competitive vendors because they see our technology as enabling their newest generation. But we can also deliver high capacity nodes and, and uh, hybrid for the, the mixed workloads. So uh, policy-based management is critical and seamless integration with OpenStack, VMware, containers, and one code base. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bill. OK. Hi, everyone. My name is Farooq Khan. Um, I'm really happy to be here to be able to talk to you. Although how I got here is a bit of a random, funny story. Um, about 10 minutes, 20 minutes ago, I was just minding my own business. I was across the street, in the park, trying to get a suntan. And uh, this guy comes running up to me and says, hey, I will give you $5 and some cupcakes if you run across the street with me and do a presentation on OpenStack. So before I could even say open what, he threw me in the back of a van, drove me over here, and here I am. <laughs> so while I am here, I thought I might as well talk to you and give you some Ceph architectural goodies that I've learned from my time talking to partners, talking to various customers as well. Um, stay tuned, because at the very end, I'll also tell you how you can win a home that is also part of the Rackspace raffle. That's right, I said a home. So what the heck is Ceph? Ceph is a software-defined storage platform that is fantastically scalable and can back Nova, Cinder, Swift, Glance, and even Keystone. And it's rising to popularity very much so. Now, how many networks are recommended to use for Ceph? Two of them. Why? Because on the front end, you need one for reads and writes. On the back end, where Ceph is particularly chatty, you also need one to be able to handle things such as node additions, replication, heartbeat, and also if a node fails, for Ceph to be able to rebalance. So all of that takes a lot of CPU, a lot of I.O. It's very important to be able to separate out your networks in order to mitigate that from happening. Go. How many nodes should I actually start with? Good question. So rather than have that happen, five is generally where I see a lot of customers, a lot of partners go with. That's a good baseline, and there are many reasons for that. 
um, which I'm happy to go through after this, because I don't have very long to talk. Um, generally, the themes are around performance, they're around scalability, and also redundancy within the Ceph cluster. So bear those in mind. And what about the node configuration? Well, there's a few things to consider there. Um, firstly, Ceph is very write intensive, so you want to make sure that you use SSDs and the write intensive SSD models of that vendor. Intel, Samsung, many vendors have some great ones. Pick the ones that are right for you. And when it comes to then matching that to a good OSD and journal ratio, you want to say about one journal to about four to five OSDs. That's a good production start and then scaling from there. Failure domains is another thing to think about in terms of physical redundancy. So this is where by taking a physical node out of the cluster and putting that in a separate rack, giving yourself another level of availability, or as long as you ensure that you size the top of rack switches correctly to give you enough cabinet to cabinet throughput. And the final thing on there is fast NICs. So what does that actually mean? Well, it does not mean using one gig networking in production. You deserve a slap for that, Robin. That is a terrible question. Nobody likes you, and Batman should be slapping you. Now, if your customers ask you that, do not slap your customers. I am not condoning violence by this slide. I'm merely saying to you, tell them to use 10 gig. 10 gig networking inside your environment for a Ceph cluster is where you should begin. As more options become available for 25, 50 gig NICs, as they become more cost effective, then you can scale up accordingly and benefit from that too. What about the actual storage? So how much storage do you need? Think about that by the amount of replicas you have. If you have three replicas, or even two, then that's how many times over you need to times your storage. So if I need 10 gigs of storage, usable, I actually need three times that amount if I have three replicas to give me the 30 inside my cluster. So bear that in mind as you're going through and sizing your environment. So finally, um, let's look at the actual two types of storage pool in Ceph. One is replicated. We've been talking about that throughout. The other is erasure coded. So the replicated side, as you can see, very durable, um, very easy to recover from. Erasure coding in comparison, still durable, not maybe as much, but certainly more cost effective. What you have to remember is to balance that cost effectiveness with what your users actually want. Um, and if you have a high I.O. cluster, for example, erasure coding may not be the best choice for you. Last few things. So as you know, prizes to be won still in the raffle. There's also one at the Rackspace table, like I said, which is a home. Now, for those of you getting your hopes up that it was an actual home, I'm sorry, we live in San Jose, and that's not happening. So this is a Google home. Just go to that table, and you'll be able to do that. Last question. Where are the cupcakes? <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy birthday, OpenStack. Thank you. Jim from Randis. So consuming clouds and cake, what, what is this guy going to talk about for five minutes or less? Thank you, sir. Hopefully make some sense here. I think we're, we're really thinking about the way clouds are being consumed and used by practitioners differently and moving toward this consume model. So if we think from left to right, in the old world, even with enterprise applications before cloud, it was always thought of it as this big, huge, heavy stack. You start with the top, you go to the bottom, you have all the applications, all the different systems. Once you get it working, you don't touch it for three years. You do it again, you do it again, you do it again, and every time it takes forever. Even with cloud moving into this world, whether people were doing it with distributions or doing it yourself through the different layers, it ended up often still being a very big heavy lift for companies taking that on and then operating it. So getting it going, and then waiting for that next upgrade, OpenStack was also fairly cumbersome to move from one version to the next to the next. So that didn't really help either. So it was still fairly similar, still a heavy lift. Meanwhile, Amazon came along and took the public cloud by storm and really offered a different model, a black box model. And when you think of that, uh, it, it's real simple from a black box standpoint. You don't see what's going on in those build, big buildings and behind the scenes. If you open the door and go in there, yeah, there are a bunch of people running around fixing hardware, putting in new hardware, and so forth. But from the software standpoint, 
It's all done with CI/CD and very rapid change on a regular basis, hundreds of changes every day or every night. And that's where we really see things moving with what's going on in that lower part of the stack and in fact what we've been doing for quite some time in building up to the product that we've released recently. So bringing all these services together with OpenStack, which we've had for quite some time, Kubernetes more recently, rich SDN, storage as well, Linux, but being able to have that in a CI-CD consumption model drastically changes how the cloud can be operated and simplifies it, particularly for day two operations. So as we do that, we then offer a managed open cloud experience around the whole thing. So it's managed because it's turnkey and it's continuously delivered. That consumption as an operator then can either be in little bits, very often, big chunks, not so often, and anything in between. And it's all based on open source standards, all the different technologies I'll talk about. And it's a full stack design for that new consumption model as opposed to the heavy lift build model where it just stays the same for quite a period of time. And that's really our mission in life. So that is what Mirantis Cloud Platform does and what it's about. So not only is it OpenStack, but there's a lot more in there. So the cloud software in red in the middle, we have OpenStack, we've added Kubernetes, and for the rich SDN technology included, we have Open Contrail. Of course, there's OVS inside um, in OpenStack itself. And for Kubernetes, simple networking, there's Calico. And for the software-defined storage, there's Ceph. I've saved about two minutes of my talk because of the last presentation, so you know exactly what that is. But more importantly, there's also Drivetrain, which takes care of that entire lifecycle management. And then Stacklite is the operation support system that provides all the monitoring and telemetry that then allows you to drive high availability. So I want to show what that consumption model looks like in action. If we take that, in the top left, Mirantis is creating our code, and instead of putting it out every two years like the foundation and like we've formerly done, so foundation puts their, theirs out, we would hurry up and put ours out as fast as we could, ideally in a month or two, maybe a little bit longer. We're continually putting out code. We're putting out code as often as every two weeks. That could be a lot of code, could be a little bit of code, in some cases maybe no code because we're doing internal changes on things, but it's going out into, a into an external repository in the form of artifacts. So then the way that that's consumed is on premises, the customer has drivetrain, and that drivetrain is a full pipeline based on open source technology, often the to same tools that people are using up at the PaaS or application platform level. So we can use that same methodology, that same technology for cloud consumption and innovation down in the cloud itself. So as we take a, a config change or a code change, it's coming through Garrett, through Git, through Jenkins. The entire cloud infrastructure itself is modeled in reclass and then salt is what's pushing it into the cloud. I'm done. <laughs> So I'm here to tell you about this project, Dragonflow. So it's a, a network, a software-defined network project. So um, uh, I want to point out it's for virtual machines and containers. Can you hear me? Uh, virtual machines and containers. It's not new. It's been around since Kilo. Uh, so it has, it's, it's full-featured, um, two years, over two years. And it was built for scale, operability, extensibility. I don't have a visual for this, so I'll just ex explain extensibility uh, quickly. So what that means is the, the software has a pipeline, okay? So if you know networking, you know pipelines, um, tables that you can plug, you can create new tables. It has hooks so that you can call out to your function, and you can very easily add applications. So if, you're, if you want to experiment, if you want to extend OpenStack to do something in networking, Okay, anything in the control plane, very easy to do it with Dragonflow. Um, and I'll go on to pluggable databases and, and the scale next. So 
um, in terms of scale, so we built for scale, and the way we did that was by moving the controller. So normally in networking, there's a controller that's programming the software switches, okay, or programming the tours, but there's a controller that's programming the network. And the controller has all this state, and it ha knows all these things about virtual machines. It knows the networks, their IP addresses, it knows the security groups, the firewalls, all of this stuff has to go out and be programmed into software switches normally if you're doing overlays, and if not, you're programming tours. And the controller is the bottleneck, almost always. So what, we've done, what we did was we focused on the database. And the database, basically database and pub sub, and you push out everything, and the controller is totally distributed. So if you're used to OpenStack with a um, network node, and the network node is there to do lots of functions like DHCP, uh, it does your metadata, uh, some, in some instances it does your layer three, uh, your source NAT, we remove all of that, and we do everything from the, loc from the compute node, totally distributed. Now, I'm gonna talk about pluggability of the database for a second. Why is it important to have a pluggable database? Let's say you have a Kubernetes in, in, uh, uh, deployment, and Kubernetes is using etcd, and you don't wanna use some other database. Here I'm using Redis. You might wanna, you might wanna use etcd. We have an etcd uh, backend, and so you could use the same uh, technology for both of your deployments. And, uh, and of course, this can do networking for both Kubernetes and for OpenStack. Um, so in this case, what I wanna show here is that we put Redis in the back end, and this is a baseline test where we had 32 servers and we, we, we ran a, a test. We, we launched an OpenStack configuration, ran it, and then we ran the same test with 4,000 controllers. So we didn't have enough hardware to do 4,000 compute nodes. We ran 130 controllers on each compute node. This is a test of the control plane. So basically you can see there are 4,000 controllers up top, 130 per node. The 130 are all talking to the same open V switch, the software switch, but each is, is configuring a different bridge, okay? And so we ran the same OpenStack, um, sorry, the same OpenStack script populating um, ports, virtual, essentially virtual machines. Um, and, and, we, and we measure, and the results are here. Basically, on the left in blue, so there are three scenarios that we run. In blue, you can see the performance, the, the, the runtime to, to, to set up OpenStack with our configuration. Um, when, when we had uh, 30, 30 nodes, and then when we have 4,000, that's on the right, so just a slight increase. So basically, because of the distributed nature of the architecture, and because everything is basically being pushed by the database, Redis, uh, and Redis has plenty of performance with just five nodes, um, there's no impact whatsoever. And all the controllers get the same information and they install the flows and they get the topology ready for you. So lessons learned. Um, so Dragonflow can scale and maintain the same performance. Neutron instead needs to improve the Neutron script just takes a long time. If you fork Neutron, then you can go faster, but Neutron just, the, the, the API needs to go faster. Uh, we can scale, it's production ready, we can go to thousands of nodes the way the Kubernetes community tests with a uh, thousand nodes as a minimum. This, is, this should be, become standard for us as well. And Redis uh, does great, uh, millions of, 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 of notifications. And finally, please just check us out. Good? Thank you all. So I'm gonna talk about uh, OpenStack and containers, uh, the same topic that I think everybody's been talking about. Uh, I mean, it, the last OpenStack summit was really the last container summit, right? Isn't that what it was? <laughs> Happy birthday, OpenStack. Um, there's a lot to talk about, actually. Um, where's the clicker? It means I can actually go fast, since I've already lost 15 seconds. Uh, so who am I? I'm the founder of CTO or, and CTO of uh, Humus Technologies. We're a cloud enablement company. We help you figure out what the right cloud is. And part of that is helping people understand where containers fit and where they don't fit. Um, you know, containers really are a development tool. That's where it's come from. That's why we have all this need from our developer customers to actually implement and deploy containers. And really, they're a way of bundling an application. And we see that in how OpenStack wants to use containers and how application developers want to use containers. Um, they're multi-platform. We find people like the ability to develop something on their laptop and then run it, the exact same thing in production, a very powerful tool. 
They're also very light. Often containers can start within seconds, whereas a virtual machine or even a physical machine might take minutes to, to launch. So a very powerful technology. A um, little bit of history it sort of goes all the way back to when people started sharing systems and sort of separating the story. A lot of the people that were in my class were like, wait, I heard this already. <laughs> I have to listen to it again. Um, but we're really looking at a way of separating the process. So processes already have process level security. Containers take it to a whole new level by actually integrating not just the process itself, but all of the libraries and resources that that one particular process needs to separate the, the, the capabilities out. And that's a really powerful component uh, when looking at, at implementing an application environment. Um, there are still some issues that some people have, specifically the fact that I'm still talking to one kernel. In a virtual machine, you get your own. In the container world, you get to share with others. So you know, sometimes you just have to be a good neighbor. Um, but you know, the, the real driver behind this, I think, is the development community. So the folks that, that are big DevOps proponents love developing things. They don't really like the ops part. They did it because they could and because, in a sense, it made their lives easier. Well, containers make their lives even easier because now their operations it focuses just on the bundling of that container rather than the actual operations of the underlying infrastructure. So the resources really sort of come together much better. Um, really. Containers and developers go together like uh, well, cupcakes and OpenStack. <laughs> um, but in the end, we still need to operate an infrastructure that supports that. And I think that's where these two pieces really start to come together. Um, if, if we talk to some people, they would say, we don't need OpenStack anymore. It's done. We can just do all of this with containers. But I think we all know better. Uh, the pieces really sort of do have other benefits. At the base level, uh, you know, we heard earlier that uh, there are some really nice integrations even between some of the container operating environments like Kubernetes and an underlying OpenStack. I still need load balancing. I still need VPN. I still need DDoS protection. I still need storage. Uh, and accessing all these services is really one of the things that OpenStack has brought to bear as a very flexible, simple technology. It's something that we can all leverage. So there are really two parts to the story, though. Right, because there are, uh, there, there are containers running on OpenStack being able to leverage OpenStack, and there's also OpenStack running on containers. And we're seeing interesting use cases in both environments. In terms of OpenStack supporting containers, deploying Kubernetes on top, deploying Docker Swarm on top, deploying the next great thing on top from the container world, there are a number of technologies like Magnum, uh, fun, that should have been Zune, uh, and <laughs> Uh, certainly, you can also just use VMs and another application like an Ansible tool or Chef or Salt, et cetera, to actually deploy containers on top of that environment. But OpenStack is another interesting use case for the container environment because OpenStack in and of itself is a distributed application. If the benefits of containers make sense for application developers, why would it not make sense for an OpenStack uh, end user, an OpenStack application uh, deployer? So really, we can look at oops, a couple of technologies uh, and I'm going backwards and forwards too much. Um, the couple of technologies, the Kala project, and specifically now the Kala Kubernetes project for actually leveraging the container infrastructure, whether just containerizing the applications and deploying with Ansible, or actually using Kubernetes to deploy those containerized components and deploying an OpenStack service in that fashion. So, you know, I think we see that containers are a core part of application development. OpenStack as an application is something that fits really well into that, and that's, I think, where it's all going. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.